Yes. Yeah, you can start. Okay, so once again, good evening, all of you. Uh, really excited and thrilled uh, to you know be sharing with all of you today. So like my topic, it's already uh, mentioned, it's Naglan beyond the Falcon capital of the world. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you must have heard about the Amor Falcons visiting Naglan, but I, I do really feel there's more to the Falcons uh, and conservation of Falcons in Naglan uh, than we know about. So after I talk about Falcons, I'm gonna be talking about something else again, and that I, I believe is very, very important. <clears throat> so that's it, uh, because we're all, you know, still, uh, not able to go out as freely as we want to. I'm going to take all of you on a tour. And okay, yeah, so I'm going to just name our tour the Falcon Tour because we're going to be talking about falcons. We're going to be looking at some falcons and some pictures. So the first thing I would want to do is, you know, there it is. Uh, let's see where you all are, and I'll show you where I am right now. So I believe uh, this is where your university is, the uh, Symbiosis International University. And from here, I'm going to take all of you out of your university and we're going to go to Naglan. So just buckle up and we'll just go see where I am. So we're just flying out of uh, your university and here we are in the easternmost corner of the country. And what you're seeing here is the water body. I think you can all already uh, figure that out by the shape of it. And this is called the uh, Doyang Reservoir uh, wetland. It's the Doyang Reservoir uh, located in, in Woka. We're gonna be talking a lot about this, uh, this reservoir uh, as, our, as my talk progresses. But I just want to show you a little bit more about this place. So first of all, again, welcome to Naglan now. Now you all are in Naglan, you're no more in, you know, wherever you may be. So this is just a, a brief uh, map uh, showing uh, where, where Nagaland is. Uh, like I said, it's in the easternmost uh, corner of the country. And that mark there, the red mark that you can see beeping, that's where Woka is and that's where the Doyang Reservoir is. So there, there are over 16 tribes in Nagaland. And just for your information, the, it's, it's a small state. It is a small state, but it is very diverse because even though there are 16 tribes, we do not understand each other. That's how diverse we are in terms of language and in terms of our dialect. So that state, uh, you know, the, the total square uh, kilometer in the state is 16,000, over, slightly over 16,000. As mentioned there, you know, in, in the PPT, you would see Mount Sarmati, that is around 3,840 uh, meters, is the highest mountain peak in the state. The lowest plains are about uh, 100 meters. And here in the map I've mentioned, you would see on the eastern, on the western side, you would see Assam. And on the west, uh, eastern side, you would see Myanmar. So it is very interesting because the lower plains are all, you know, towards the western side, towards Assam. And the highest points are towards Myanmar. Uh, now, now that said, uh, you know, this elevation gradient, the elevation gradient gives an opportunity for um, different types of forest types. And that's why we have about at least about nine types of forests in this small state, which also uh, just amplifies the number of species or diversity of wildlife that we find in our state. And yes, this, uh, like I said, there are many tribes, and uh, our, uh, the tribes in Ireland are very closely uh, linked with nature, and our biodiversity has a lot of importance or significance in our culture and traditions. In just this picture alone, I'm going to show you six different, uh, you know, connections that tribes have with our biodiversity. So please uh, uh, keep your eye on the PPT and check where the points are going to come. So there is the first one. What you see there is the feather of a great hornbill. Then that is the fur of a bear on the headgear. The third one is the tusk of a wild boar. The fourth one is the claws of bears again. The fifth one is armband, usually made of uh, animal bones like elephants. Then the sixth ones are tiger canines. So you can see in this one picture itself, in this one traditional attire itself, I've shown you six different kinds. If I, would, if I were to show you about all the tribes, uh, it's gonna take a very long time, uh, rest assured. 
Moving forward, this is the state bird uh, called the blight struck one. Uh, it is a threatened species. Then we have a state animal that is the mitoon. And of course, uh, I think you would all know what this is. It's the, it's the Raja Mircha. I think people usually identify Nagaland or Assam with you know, this boot jodokia, which is, if you see on the right side, you would see that it is one of the uh, spiciest peppers uh, in the world. That said, I think our tool will not be complete if I would not show you the falcons itself. So keeping everything aside, we're gonna dive straight into the falcons. And to start with, I'm gonna uh, just try and explain to you what the differences are between the male and female falcons. So this is uh, what a male looks like. And as, per as you see in the description, it's dark gray. It has a rufous tie and vents. And the female has more of barrings and you know, it has whitish underparts. So when you fly, this is what a female will look like. And of course, uh, there's one at the back, a nosy one I would call him. That's a male trying to bombard the bomb, uh, the, the female there. So this is what uh, falcons look like when they fly. I'm going to now talk about the spectacle that, you know, I so always, I'm always uh, amused, uh, you know, and in awe of the falcons because when they come, uh, it, it's, it's quite a phenomenon. So for the spectacle, I'm going to first talk about the great migration itself. Now, if you look at this map, you would see the orange uh, portion uh, towards the uh, north, northeast of India, that's uh, in towards Mongolia and you know uh, northern part of China, Siberia as well. So that's where the breeding grounds of the emerald falcons are. And if you look at the lower part that's highlighted in yellow in the southern part of Africa, that's where the wintering grounds are. Now this distance, one way itself, is about 11,000 kilometers. And you see Nagaland is right there marked uh, in red. And what you see in, in gray is actually their, their migration uh, route. So like I say, one way it takes them about uh, 11,000 kilometers. Now, these falcons, these, they're not very big. Uh, so they're about 150 or 180 grams. So they're not very big birds, not very big raptors. For them to fly, for, for this distance and do it twice a year. That is a lot for us. Needless to say, now, emerald falcons are one of the longest migra uh, migratory raptors in the world. They are a true transcontinental, uh, trans-equatorial, long distance flocking migrant, as, uh, as stated in the migra uh, migrating raptors of the world. Now, what's more interesting again about these birds, uh, besides their very long migration, is if you look at the map again, you would see, you know, from the western uh, coast, that is towards, of course, where you are right now, and to reach Africa, they have to cross the Arabian Sea. Now, not not all birds can do this. It 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 demands a lot of effort from these tiny birds. They have, uh, they have to fly for about four thousand kilometers over waters, non-stop, day and night, rain or shine. It is quite a task. And this is why, you know, emerald falcons are very important uh, in terms of, you know, having uh, this, uh, their role in, in a lot, uh, uh, compared to many other species. And this fly, uh, you know, over the Arabian Sea is the greatest by any uh, bird of prey. Now, this, this part where they have to fly over the ocean is very important with regard to Nagaland, and I'll be coming to that in the later part of the uh, discussion. So, now you have seen that, you know, the birds come and stop over at Nagaland. Why? Why would they come? And this is the only reason. These are uh, flying termites called elite. And these are high in protein and especially fat. And for the for the falcons to fly over that four thousand kilometer that I was just talking about, they need to be uh, you know having enough fat fat reserves. They should build on their fat to be able to fly that nonstop. And that because that demands a lot of energy, they have to come and stop over not only in Nagaland but in some other parts of Northeast India as well. Build their fat reserves, then proceed. The, a bird, an individual, would stop for about two to three weeks. Just you know 
all they do while they come here is fly a little bit around in and around to see the wherever they're resting and try to eat as much as they can. It is really important. That is why it is important to protect the stopover sites in Northeast India, especially in Nagaland, where there are like some really important stopover sites. Only after they can build their fat reserves can they proceed for their future uh, migration. And again, I'll be coming back to this point a little later, but I'll be going ahead it now. So this is what the you know emerald pelicans look like once they come in Nagaland. And um, I'm sure it's not going to be easy to be counting them. Uh, and I'm just going to be for you all. Yeah, this is what they look like. So that's what you know their congregation looks like. I'm not sure if you could hear the sound of this video. Was it audible? Because then you would hear the birds chirping actually. No, Lanzo, we can't hear sound. Okay, uh, no me. problem. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I wish, I really wish you could hear the sound of these birds chirping, you know, in like the thousands and lakhs of them. But I guess that's, you know, an invitation I'm going to give you all from now that you should come and watch this, you know, spectacle for yourself in Nagaland someday soon. But moving ahead, you know, if some of you would want to count the falcons, it is right here in front of you. You can start counting while I talk about, you know, the stopover site uh, and why it's important. Uh, just a minute, please. Okay, so the stopover site, as I was mentioning earlier, the Doyang Reservoir. It's built on the Yang uh, River, the largest uh, river in Nagaland. And the catchment area is now an important stopover site for Falcon because of their you know, exceptional, uh, exceptionally large numbers and uh, their conservation values. Nagaland is now tagged as the Falcon capital of the world. And this congregation of Emerald Falcons is known to be the largest anywhere on the planet. Let's say, uh, if you're done counting, we'll just move on to the next slide. I'm gonna show you again uh, the Doyang Reservoir. So yeah, there, there's the reservoir and I'm just gonna take you to where the roosting site is. So where we're looking at now is the actual roosting site of the uh, Emerald Falcons in Doyang Reservoir in Tongti village. You must, whenever you talk about Emerald Falcons, I'm sure you would have heard the place called Tong. And we're going to be talking about this particular village now. This is what Doyang Reservoir looks like uh, if you were to come and see. And this is another aerial view of the reservoir. And now coming, coming to the story, uh, there's uh, the good and the bad. And I'm going to start off with the bad. The massacre, 2012. You know, there was a report by Conservation India that Emerald Falcons were being uh, killed harvested in thousands and lakhs. And this report was true. And uh, this is how the raptors were being caught. What you see here is a male emerald falcon entangled in a fishing net. What, how people were capturing was not by shooting them down, but people were actually putting up nets uh, to capture them. So these were mostly fishermen. And it was all by fluke that they, they learned about how to capture the falcons. So some fishermen were just drying up their nets differently. And that's when some of the falcons got caught and they knew, okay, maybe we can use these nets to catch more birds and sell them. So in due process of time, people put up a lot of nets and this is how they were, you know, after they were caught in the nets, they were removed and put in uh, these kind of cases and of course, collected and transported, you know, wherever people demanded. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, people wrote a lot about this, people, uh, you know, different organizations, di uh, different people, uh, government, non-government, like everyone started talking about the, the uh, massacre in 2012. This was, you know, not, not good, just not just for the state, but for the country as well. But why, why were the people doing this? I think this is a question that we should not overlook as well and ponder upon. So, when I was talking about the uh, reservoir being created, 
on the Yang River. About 2,400 hectares of fertile land, of fertile land was being submerged in the process. There was also a problem, problem of erosions in the, in the hills wherever people were trying to cultivate uh, or do agriculture. And also, uh, there were, of course, there were elephants near place, so there were, you know, elephant depredation. There was unemployment problems. There were cases of reduced fish catch and also poor road connectivity. But then I've written something up here. If you notice, I've mentioned manna from heaven. So this is how people considered the falcons. What is interesting is, you know, these falcons, although they were coming since many years back, the numbers by which they were coming only increased after the creation of the dam. So while on one hand, the villagers were losing part of their uh, livelihood in terms of agriculture, they thought, okay, manam, they, this is manam from heaven. Manam basically means God sent food. So that's how people in the villages considered these birds. So they were like, okay, so many birds are starting to come now to this dam. Let's just capture them. It's like a blessing for us that God has sent. And then they started catching as much as they could. They sold them. Of course, mostly to meet, uh, to pay for education for the kids and also to save some money for uh, festivals. That is, one is the, uh, the Tokuemung festival, that's the post harvest festival for the uh, Lhosa tribe, and the Christmas uh, uh, festival. So, this was one of the reasons why this was happening. Now, post 2012, I mean, everyone was alarmed by this case, and some steps had to be taken immediately. And so the road to recovery began immediately. The focus was on four things mostly. One was awareness creation. Then, of course, there was strict enforcement. Uh, then there was focus on generating, you know, alternate income for the people. And the fourth was ensuring community participation in conserving or getting birds. So a lot of you know things with uh, village elders, not just Pangsi village, but you know some other villages in in and around the, the landscape, and you know involving church, uh, talking to a lot of people, having programs, having campaigns, organizing activities for kids or for anyone who can be part of it. You know, efforts were made basically to reach out to as much people and as quick as possible. So here, uh, you know, we can also see uh, more uh, outreach programs. Uh, in the villages, in different uh, parts, and also making it sure you know the children, the, the kids are not left out in the process. Then came the the enforcement part, uh, and then came the other tag. If you remember in the beginning of the slide, I've told you that you know uh, Nagaland was tagged as falcon capital of the world. But another tag also happened along the process of you know trying to bring conservation and making people aware of the birds. That was the satellite tagging. If you can see these three birds, they were the first birds to be tagged uh, by this very small um, GPS unit. Uh, there was solar power, and the, these three birds were also uh, named uh, after the the place and people. So this is the male falcon was named as Naga. Another female was named as Woka. Another female was named as Pangti. Now, what this exercise, you know, it was purely sci uh, for scientific purpose, of course, uh, to make us, you know, understand uh, the falcons better. But in in the in the process, it also became uh, quite a game changer in the conservation efforts that were underplay uh, underway already. Because by naming these birds according to the place and the people, uh, people, you know, in the community started to have a sense of ownership and responsibility towards protecting these birds, it became a matter of pride. And this, uh, you know, became uh, one of the defining moments in the Emerald Falcon conservation success story in Pangti. <clears throat> so here you can see uh, one of the female, and this happens to be Pangti, uh, being released uh, by the villagers in presence of uh, for, uh, some department officials and scientists from WII and Hungary who were actually part of the uh, Emerald Falcon tagging uh, process. And, you know, the people, or by this time, already people have, you know, got so much um, connection to the birds that they even prayed before releasing the birds. And so this is what I would say, you know, that despite the initial setback, 
the people of Tongti village led by example to show the kind of conservation success that the community can bring about. And this is really important as, as our talk progresses, I, I hope that you know, uh, this will become more clear. Now, another thing that the government did was, you know, in 2013, during the World Environment Day, uh, the state government declared the Emerald Falcons as state guests. Now, with all of these efforts, what happened was that in 2012, we had all of these very negative, um, unfortunate events happening. And in 2013, by the end of the migration period, zero hunting of Emerald Falcons at Pangti was achieved. The year was declared as a hunting free year. The people had literally turned from hunters to protectors in a span of one year. Now, uh, it may be, it may not uh, mean too much for, for some people, but for, for places like Naglin or not just India, where still, you know, hunting still exists, it was quite a, quite a big task. And uh, of course, this, this now made uh, some very positive news. And if you, would, if you would had seen some of these uh, uh, headlines that have uh, faced it here, you will see that the same persons that had you know, talked about what was going wrong in, in 2012, those same persons were now writing about something that was going right in Naglin and in India with respect to American conservation. So uh, this was definitely the dawn of a new beginning. This was followed by, of course, a lot of awards and recognitions from various uh, bodies, including DMS, which is the Convention of uh, well, Convention on the Conservation of Migrated Species of Wild Animals, which India is also a, a partner to, and of course many other uh, NGOs, government organizations, and I would say that you know the recognition still follows to this day, just as we follow our tag birds. And with, with this, I come to the next that is following our tag emerald falcons. What you see here are the uh, track routes, you know, of the three birds that I've been talking about: Pangti. Woka and Naga. The red spot that you can see on, on the top is uh, Tangti, and the other two are uh, Woka and Naga. Now I'm gonna just show you one, one slide again, and this is really important. It really hit me hard. So this is about Pangti, and if you just look towards the uh, top right of my slide, you would see, you know, there's a timeline. So it's showing that, you know, towards the left, it's showing that, you know, Pangti was tagged TPS tagged in the year 2013 uh, on November 7. And in 2016, we're now looking, uh, 2016 November, day 12, starting from day 12, we're just gonna look. So please look at this carefully. And it's gonna, I hope it means to you as much as it meant to me when I first saw this. So on day 12, it's just arriving for uh, Naglin. It's already arrived Naglin. Now, it's still in Naglin, and it's now moving out, it's, and it's crossing over the Arabian Sea. And there it is, it ended there abruptly. And we don't know if, you know, maybe the GPS stopped working or maybe the bird died, but there's high chances the bird didn't make it to, la to, you know, to land that year. Maybe that, you know, over the sea, it could not continue anymore. Uh, and it just, maybe it just died. And this is how difficult this, this flight over the ocean is. And this is why there, you know, like I mentioned earlier, their stay in, in Nagaland and Northeast India is so much more important because if they really do not you know, take care of their health, if they really do not you know, build on their fat reserves and gain the energy that they need for this 4,000 kilometer over the water nonstop flight, there's high chances they will not make it. And this is just one bird that we tagged, I mean, and we got information about. There may be so many other, because they're in the millions, in lakhs, there may be so many other birds, you know, that's probably not making it to, to, to their land. They might be just dying over the ocean. So when uh, this thing really hit me hard and I, I just hope, you know, it just invokes a sense of, you know, uh, the need to really protect not just the bird, but its environment as well, its habitat as well. <clears throat> But the good thing is, you know, over the years, again, uh, we've identified more important roost, roosting sites in Naglin itself, other than Woka, you know, where the Doyang Reservoir is, we have also found there are five more, you know, places where a lot of uh, major roosting happens as well. Lanso, uh, can you tell them what is roosting? Okay, so, sure. So roosting is basically, you know, the birds, they come and they rest uh, 
uh, and they, they usually perch on trees and they just you know sleep through the night. So so that uh, in 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 very simple form, that's what roosting is. They come and it's a place for them to rest. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and see. Uh, um, like I said, because you know this this bird that were first tagged really had a big impact on the people of of uh, of the of the local community. And also it gave us very good data, you know, scientists and researchers were able to understand more about these structures. And so they made another effort in 2016 and tagged six more birds and from different places again. And all of this again was very beneficial to science and also uh, in winning trust uh, and, you know, connection from the people. So, but I want to want also talk about this one bird. If you, met, if you can see here, the second bird, long length, the female. So this female um, created some record in the sense that you know it became uh, the uh, bird that has been tagged for the longest, uh, about 1,176 days. That's about three months, three years and eight months. What's interesting is that you know remember the the the, um, the flight over the Arabian Sea. So this particular bird did it seven times, and we're sure it has already done it before we even tagged it. So we know after we tagged it, it had done it seven times. And it had raked up, you know, about 1,000, sorry, 1 lakh 56,000 kilometers of flight over this duration. So uh, these small birds are by no means, you know, uh, as weak as someone might think. So now that's it. Uh, here I want to tell you, if anyone's interested, you can definitely log into this site, uh, satellitetracking.eu, and. Currently, all the birds that I was talking about, they're not active anymore, but there's this one bird that was tagged in Manipur called Irang, I-R-A-N-G. This bird is still active. The satellite is still the satellite tag is still active and you can track it R by R also if you want to. So it's always, uh, it's already there on the website. Anyone's interested, you can definitely uh, go and check out. And I'm just gonna show, uh, this is uh, the latest data I have uh, of Irang. And I'm on, I want to show you again another bird crossing the, sorry, uh, crossing the, oops, for some reason it's not coming, hold on. Okay. Now you can see it's crossing, uh, it's reached Nagaland and it's crossing the ocean and this bird safely made it to land. So it, it left on, you know, it left the Western coast on 11th November reached the other side on in Africa on 13 November, so basically about three days. So yeah, so the good thing is, uh, though some birds may not make it, uh, majority of them makes it uh, to, 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 to land. Now again, if some of you might want to still count them, here's another opportunity. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna, you know, quote a statement uh, made by uh, Rosalie A. Edge. Uh, she was an environmental advocate and founded the first ever uh, uh, preserve uh, for uh, birds of prey. So what she said was that the time to protect a species is while it is still common. Now many people think, okay, emerald falcons are in such large numbers, you know, their like population is not as threatened as you may think, but no, they are. And this is the best time to protect them because if you if you think about uh, Passenger pigeons, you know, their numbers were as mind-boggling as the uh, the emerald falcons. But you know, these birds they need to uh, be together all the time. So when their population declines to an to an extent where they cannot recover, although they may be still individuals, they may just probably just uh, go extinct. And so it's very very important to protect them. Even though we think they're in good numbers now, it's still very very important to keep continue to continue protecting these birds. So now, uh, where was, uh, yeah, so yeah, now again, uh, this, if you see, uh, it's the roosting site I showed you earlier, where they come and rest at night, yeah? But something happened last year. The birds decided to shift the roosting site a little bit. This is in Pangti, what we're looking now. And we're just gonna fly maybe some three, four kilometer aerial distance and go to this place. So I want you to look at this very carefully. So this landmass that you can see protruding out from about one o'clock, coming towards the middle. Uh, this I want you to remember because we're going to be talking about this. Now this is the neighboring village of Pangti. It's called Ariol Village. 
and this is uh, what it would look like. So I'm still focusing on the land mass there. I'm just focusing out. And this is what it looks like in real. Now, uh, what I want to talk about is, if you remember the landmass, look at your three o'clock, you would see a small patch of forest that's whitish in color. If you notice the trees, I'm not sure if the internet is be, gonna be clear enough for you to notice it, but I hope you do. I'll be talking about that again, but before that, what you see here, you would see very less trees and a lot of tall grasses. These grasses are somewhere between nine, 10 feet tall. So what happened was all this while we always, at least for, uh, with regard to Nagaland, we have always uh, thought about you know birds, these emerald falcons, just uh, perching on trees and just resting on trees, roosting on trees. Now in this new uh, place that they were uh, they had picked up last year, they were actually perching even on these grasses. It was something very new to me. Probably they do it when they go to Southern Africa, but we had never seen anything like this uh, before. So it was very interesting that you know they chose this new place which is also very um, remote and have uh, very less human disturbance. So these birds are scattered all over this place. And make, you know, uh, just, you, you, you put your binoculars on and look at this, uh, point towards the grasses and you would see like, you know, you would think they're just flowers you know, over all of these grasses because there's just so many uh, emeralds perching on these grasses. But on the right side that I talked about, the, uh, the small forest patch. I want to tell you something about this. So if you look at this, the white patches, this is what it actually looks like inside. So this is after the falcons that left, you know, last year. Uh, the, the birds, you know, because they come in thousands and lakhs and they, they just perch and just roost in this one particular area. By the time they leave, this is what they do with their poop. You know, it's like all white in color. So it's as if they painted the entire landscape. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting to tell. So this is the latest, uh, you know, uh, uh, video I want to show you. Uh, this is last uh, migration season, last fall migration. So this was taken on day uh, 17 November. So sometimes I think you know it's easier to count stars because stars do not move at least. But yeah, their numbers are very, very big. But you know what I think is that you know, as spectacular as these emerald falcons are, they are very mysterious. Why I say this is because, like I mentioned, this video was taken on 17 November. By 18 or 19 November, it was as if there were no birds here. And over the years, we've been observing that you know maybe that's just their behavior. Uh, you know, one fine day, you just wake up. You're camping near the falcons. You're just trying to you know, monitor uh, uh, their their migration, just trying to protect them. And you wake up one fine morning, and then you don't see the birds anymore. Maybe there are just a few flying here and there, but then the larger flock is nowhere to be seen. And that's mostly, I think, because um, we know that they come in batches. They don't come at one go, and they live in batches as well. But when they leave, uh, it's a big uh, flock that leaves that makes a big gap. You know. So by, by date 19 and 20, the flock, the falcons had reduced so much that you know it was very difficult to start seeing them anymore. So I think there's so much that we still need to know about uh, these species. And uh, in the same way, I, I think you know by this time, I, I think there are some birds still hanging around near, near your campus and other areas. And I think, especially not Lonavala, I think I keep seeing some updates from there. People see uh, a lot of falcons there. So it's like this image uh, sent by one of my friends, Kenneth. It's, it's really lovely with the flowers there. Uh, I really hope that you can also go see these falcons, but just be very careful not to go too close to them. I think that's why there has been some restrictions in Lonavala. But yes, I do hope you can see uh, the, the guests, our guests who have just left Nagalan and are now uh, in your place. But this is the, uh, the core of what, what I want to be talking about. What's beyond, what, what is beyond this? What is, you know, why, why why are we talking about this emerald falcons conservation? Why are we talking about these success stories? There must be something that's you know driving these people, right? And that is something I want to focus on today. That's something I want to ponder on, and I want our uh, well, focus to go on that in that direction now. So I'm just going to rewind again. Like, like I said, there's so many tribes, so many uh, culture, then the different forest types, and which also means different, a uh, lot more biodiversity. 
But something I did not mention earlier, uh, I'll be coming to that is when you look at this for a second, this is so an example of the lowlands uh, towards Assam. And you can see the, you know, the mountains are starting. And then if you go towards the Eastern side, uh, towards Myanmar, then this is what the forest looks like. And that's Mount Saramati at the back. So all of these forests, you know, they're actually owned by the communities. In Nagaland, only about 12% of the forest area is in the direct control of the forest department or the government. The rest, about 88% belongs to communities or are uh, privately owned. So now this is important because, you know, for lasting conser conservation to happen in places like Naglan and other Northeastern states, the need for the participation of the local community is key. That's what I, I really believe in. In places where community themselves come forward, conservation has largely succeeded. And the need for conservation has to come from within the community. I agree that you know there has to be some level of en uh, enforcement as well, but it has to come from within. And this is why I really want to put our focus towards community-based conservation because that's what's happening here. <clears throat> this is why you know it's really important for me personally to you know try and talk as much as I can to local communities, to local people, inform them about what they have, you know, make them aware about what they might be losing uh, or what might go extinct in their place if they're not careful, and involve them and ensure their participation in conservation. Unless this happens, it's gonna be, uh, you know, always a uh, failed effort, that's what I feel. <clears throat> so uh, for sure, you know, you know community-based conservation itself has uh, some of its own challenges. Uh, quite literally, we're just walking into people's property, telling them to conserve or protect whatever they have. Uh, it can be quite uh, challenging sometimes, but the good thing is there are already many villages who are protecting their forests, their wildlife, their biodiversity. They're initiating themselves and managing it themselves. So that's that's a good thing. In fact, you know, uh, there are 407 community conserved areas already in place in the state. In doing so, these people are not just, you know, these communities are not just uh, protecting their biodiversity, they're also preserving their culture and traditions. This I say because, you know, the, the culture and traditions of the Naga tribes being so closely interwoven, so, so closely linked with nature. Losing our biodiversity would mean losing a part of our identity. And that is something I don't think anybody can afford. Um, I just want to give you some more examples of these community conserved areas and this uh, community-based conservation that's uh, happening uh, in, in Naglan. This landscape here mentioned here is the Fakim Saramati uh, landscape. And I'm just gonna let us fly out of you know Doyang again and go towards uh, the eastern side uh, near Myanmar. So here we are now, about 300 kilometers away. And what you see here, the the barren area towards the bottom of the screen is the top of Mount Saramati. So you know because it's such high elevation right now, there's snow uh, there. It you know there are no trees there. There are just some very short. Uh, uh, plants there. But what's interesting is, you know, this one, this is the forest around this. And this is what I'm talking about. These are all community, community lands, community forest. And some of you might have seen uh, this image of this cloud leopard that's been doing rounds lately. So uh, it is one of the highest recorded uh, cloud leopard at, in terms of elevation, 3,700 meters. Uh, one of the highest records in, Naga, in, 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 in India, in our country. And this was a um, part of a study undertaken by Nair Al, uh, 2021. And they had been working in this Tanamir landscape, uh, that is, the, uh, sorry, in Tanamir village, that is the Fakim uh, Saramati landscape. And they had recorded this cloud leopard. So uh, that's as I was saying, you know, how important it is to get the local communities involved, this, this team by Nair, uh, uh, Nair have been uh, very actively involving the local communities in their efforts. And that is something I really, really appreciate because uh, you may do research and go, but you know, unless there's some continuity because when you leave, if the people are not interested anymore, then it becomes, you know, conservation is gone for a toss. Science may be good, but there may be no conservation aspect. So it's very important to always involve uh, local communities. And I'm so grateful that this team from, you know, WPSI 
has been doing work co uh, collaboratively with uh, the village in Taname. So this is one example, and you know, likewise, there's some other examples. So I'll just very quickly mention two other uh, community-based conservation efforts uh, that's going very well in Ireland. And one is the Young Young Chen uh, Community Biodiversity Conservation Area. Uh, you know, it was initiated by Nuclear Palm, and this effort is now credited to about uh, 250 households, uh, basically from three villages. That's uh, Yang Yingchen, Sang Lu, and Al Yong. Uh, they're conserving about 10 square kilometers of forest, and this has started since 2010. So they have, uh, I just want to mention, you know, that they're doing so well that, you know, uh, Emerald Falcons have also been roosting in this area uh, in quite large numbers, um, just like in Pangti and Ariol. And they were also recently uh, awarded the, the Whitley Award, which is also called, called the Green Oscar, to continue their efforts towards Emerald Falcon conservation and also uh, protecting their 10 square kilometer uh, landscape. The other one is the CCL, the three villages, Sukai, Kibiku, and Yuki. So these are also, you know, all neighboring villages, they've all, all come together to protect one landscape. And uh, right now they are protecting about 939 hectares of land. And out of which, you know, in this small land itself, they've already recorded so far about 222 species of birds and about 200 species of butterflies. So I think these are very encouraging uh, efforts that you know these local communities are doing on their own. And again, so I think we're using the same picture uh, for the backgrounds. And this is you know the kind of forest I'm talking about, like what we can do when people, the communities themselves, protect their own environment. Like I said, this forest that we're seeing here uh, belongs to the village of Tanamir. This is in the Sarimati landscape. And so also this forest, you know. And why, why it's important is because you, know, you, you never know what, what these uh, forests are, are going to hold, the biodiversity that they support, you know, or the other ecosystem services that they provide. You know? So I'm just going to show you some pictures, like maybe uh, this yellow thread martin that's giving a death stare, or this colossal elephant, or these nosy dogs, uh, wild dogs going about with their businesses, or these uh, palace squirrels trying to play peekaboo with, you know, with anyone maybe. And this romantic pair of um, the threatened, uh, uh, what is it? Gray peacock pheasant, sorry. Then of course, this, this horn uh, frog uh, with some really crazy eyes or this barking there that's really curious to know who's watching or the dancing emerald falcon, you know. Um, all of this, they are important uh, because they all come in community lands they all come in community forests, and that's why community-based conservation is really, really important. In conclusion, this is what I want to say. You know, about a decade ago, some local communities in Nagaland came forward to protect the magnificent Amur Falcons in what uh, in what would become one of the greatest conservation success stories in modern era. And like the Amur Falcon, you know, conservation efforts led uh, by the village of Pangti, we know now, you know, that many other villages have been protecting many other species, not just Amur Falcons by means of protecting their forests, some even prior to the uh, Falcon story. And why these communities do what they do, maybe for many reasons, you know, but one thing is for sure, that their community-based conservation efforts are an inspiration for the small states and also beyond. And I think this is, you know, to me, the actual beauty of Nagaland that, you know, you still, no matter what negativity may be around, you still try and do what you can to protect your biodiversity. So what these communities are doing is basically, you know, joining hands to protect their own backyard. And this is what I want to encourage all of us. This is a challenge that, you know, I believe we can replicate this anywhere, anytime. And maybe we should start it at home because, because we can. And I know I, I can assure you that, you know, someone's going to be very, very disappointed if we don't. Um, and he's just going to be watching all, all, all of us, like, you know, really disappointed. So this is what I'm going to challenge all of us, and you know, uh, I'm really grateful that you know such uh, an enthusiastic group of people, the students have joined today, and I'm just going to tell you to you know stay curious because you don't know what what your what your garden outside may hold, you don't know what your forest around your neighborhood may hold. Um, this is something I've taken a picture of here, and I just want to tell you that this was this outside uh, where I stay, in, in the garden, and it was it was quite a, a lovely. 
think Catherine, if anybody wants to you know, guess what it could be, I mean, you could try. I'll tell you what this is at the, at the end. So I think with this, uh, of course, these are some of the references of today's presentation. And with this, you know, I'll just end my talk today. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, I feel so illuminated after knowing all the facts, like the elevation gradient, which affects the species and the forest and what the armbands of the tribes are made of, their fur caps, and also like tagging of GPS in falcons, which was a game changer in the conservation. The most interesting part was the 1,176 kilometer flight that long length took from the Arabian Sea for seven times. It was amazing. And all the great initiatives about community conservation. For until today, for me, birds were only of three types, crows, sparrows, and pigeons, but not anymore. There is beauty all around us. And now I shall look to it for everywhere I go. Dear audience, if you have any questions, you can put that in the chat box. And we already have two questions. Um, the first one is, have there ever been any instances where the population of any particular bird have been dangerously reduced? Yes, uh, like I mentioned, the pestilary pigeon, it's now extinct, unfortunately. And at one point, the numbers were, I think, even more than what we see in the amber falcons. And people hunted uh, them so much that, you know, they could not recover anymore. So that is a very, very good example, the pestilary pigeon. The second question is, any effects on, of climate change in the migration of Amur falcons? Uh, so over the years, you know, in these past five, six years that I've been observing, uh, we do notice that, you know, uh, the falcons are slightly delaying uh, their arrival, maybe just by a few days. But, you know, I think starting from, you know, five, six years ago, I would remember they would come by you know, maybe first week of October, but now they're coming towards mid of October. So uh, it has to be, of course, we have to really uh, study a lot on it, but I'm very sure, you know, it's having some impact on the migration, uh, especially the winds, because they need the, the winds to, you know, uh, help them as well, the thermals, and of course, the rains uh, definitely plays a role in their migration. The third question is, could you please share the website where we can view the live location of the more falcons? Yes, definitely. Um, the yeah, yeah, satellite tracking. Someone just mentioned, yeah, satellite yes. tracking.eu. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Any efforts on protecting the food source of falcons, the termites? So, right now, we have not really worked uh, directly on termites uh, because, you know, these termites, uh, they are not the normal termites that you would see where they make these termite mounds. So, the most, uh, more, most of the species that we find in Nagaland are ground dwelling. So like they just say they're subterranean, they do not come, they do not make mounds. So they emerge from literally anywhere when it's time for them to emerge. So you cannot predict where they are. So it's very, very difficult to protect these termites. But of course, that is a very good question. That's something I always think about, you know, as long as we can secure their their uh, their, their prey, which is the termites, I think it'll be great. Um, someone is asking for more types of forests in Nagaland. Uh, more types of forest. I can actually read it out uh, some of the types here, but it's going to be very, you know, uh, technical. So I'm not sure if everyone's going to enjoy it, but I'm very, you know, I'll not do exactly as per the classification, but I will very briefly tell you like, the kind of forest we have. Uh, so one is the uh, tropical forest, basically three. So tropical forest, deciduous forest, and subtropical forest. And again, these three are divided into various kinds. Uh, there will be uh, the, I'll just read it out to you. The tropical wet evergreen forest, then we have the uh, scrub forest, then we also have the uh, uh, semi evergreen forest, then bamboo breaks. We also have the uh, moist forest, and we have the subtropical wet uh, hill forest. We also have the Assam subtropical pine forest, and the Naga Hill wet temperate forest, along with the mountain. Uh, a mountain uh, bamboo for, uh, breaks. If anybody needs this information, I can definitely share some uh, materials with you all as well. Yeah. So Lanzo, can you tell us, uh, uh, you said that just last year you observed that they are 
uh, roosting on in the grassland that is very new for you and it is very isolated area so uh, what is your uh, further uh, conclusion or something to look forward for a future plan why they are there or anything uh, anything about that Thank you, but that's a very good question and uh, so even uh, this is something we have just noticed so uh, we you know, yet to get some very concrete uh, finding but very briefly what we know is that you know in the previous roosting site there were some uh, human disturbances not necessarily directly at the birds but some you know development activities were happening because you've seen the pictures it's it's a beautiful place there and people are trying to develop that place so i think those anthropogenic pressures are having some impact on these birds and that's why they shifted to a place where it's like lesser disturbed or lesser anthropogenic uh, activities going on and actually that is why i was also telling you like uh, you know to if you go to see the birds in lona or somewhere nearby just be sure you do not disturb them because there are high chances they would move if they have moved in a very major resting site in ireland they would probably you know not mind moving elsewhere so we don't know if they'll come back uh, it's still a continuous this trend but for now that's what happened last year yeah okay thanks so students you can even unmute yourself and ask questions um sir i have a question although yes, it please. is very um tremendous that how naga bokha and pankti were tagged with gps and how it became a very game changing and a matter of pride in conservation of amur falcons but isn't it painful like do we tag the gps inside them or on them the process like okay so uh, can you see my presentation i'm just going to go back again i want to show you some images yeah meantime when he is going back to his presentation uh, we have given a feedback a link in the chat box so while you are in the middle of question answers please go and just it will take a one minute and fill up a feedback form it will help us for future sessions please do that okay so okay i think you can see this images now so you can you can look at long length the second bird or maybe even pom the first bird uh, you would see that the, the tag is a small unit with a long antenna right so this is actually put you know strapped on their back and there's nothing inside so it's like they're carrying a small backpack it's very light so it does not cause any trouble to these birds uh, so it's well designed and they're very very light like i said uh, so there's no trouble for the birds and it just strapped like a backpack Thank you, sir. Thank you for such an enlightening and entertaining presentation. We owe you a special vote of thanks for taking time from your busy schedule to be the guest speaker at our session and making it a huge success. Your presence and wise words help magnify our cause in the best possible way. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Pakil, for this vote of thanks also. Uh, but uh, i think uh, even we can have uh, we have time so if anyone wants to ask question they can unmute or they can write in the chat box we have five more minutes so sparkle is completely she is with uh, going on time <laughs> so good job but still uh, if anyone wants to ask otherwise i have one question <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, Uh, so and so uh, in the process of conservation of this particular bird amu falcon uh, did it help to conserve in the process other animals also something like anything happened that what we are advocating yes can you hear me i think we have lost him just we'll just wait for a moment
we'll just wait for a few minutes let him join again because i think he has lost connection Uh, meantime, those who are here, uh, can you open your videos for uh, just few seconds? We can take one group photo and yes, yeah, Lan. So we had lost you, I think, for a few seconds. Hi, Swati. Good to see you. Anna. Yeah. So can you open your videos uh, just for a few minutes? Yes, Lan. So uh, did you hear my question? Uh, you are on mute. Okay. Am I? Yeah, yeah, you are audible now. Yeah. I was, I was answering to the question that you know uh, it is having uh, some impact even for the conservation of other species. So some villagers have also given up the use of uh, air guns. You know, and these modern weapons are causing havoc uh, to all of these, especially the birds, because this, they're like they're they're. Kill percentage is very high when they use air guns. So some villagers have given up totally uh, or banned uh, use of air guns. So by doing so, you know, like more species of birds or other animals are being protected. And it's something we advocate as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, one more last, uh, one more thing. There are so many always things which I always wanted to talk with the speakers. <laughs> but one thing I want to mention, uh, when you uh, mentioned about the community, and uh, how they started looking at Amu falcons after the dam got constructed. And that's how the process of hunting started, right? You said that some uh, God had sent something for us because their land has gone under the dam, which was their first uh, otherwise, uh, you know, livelihood. So, you know, and so we never got this information from anywhere. So I think this is for the first time i'm listening from the person who is from that land directly because i had seen many you know um, uh, videos and even read some articles this particular mention that how community is looking at them and why they turned uh, to amu falcons maybe maybe one of the cause to hunt them but still uh, good you mentioned that uh, and how the community itself came forward to protect uh, these birds and other biodiversity so it's really nice to have someone from the land uh, who has you know has been doing a fantastic work and listen this story from first hand so fantastic thank you very much so I guess, uh, yeah, uh, we have come to an end. Uh, Sparkle has already given vote of thanks. <laughs> and, uh, uh, thank you very much, Anso. And we will definitely uh, get you on board for some other inputs. And you also, please knock on our door if you want to get something out of students or uh, anything, any help from student community. We are uh, really, means we will be there and ready to help. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Have a nice day, all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for turning up on a Sunday afternoon. Good to see your faces. Hi, Tanvi. Hello, ma'am. Nice to see you. Nice session. Thank you so much. Yeah. So see you on next Sunday on another uh, interesting session. Bye. See you. Bye. Have a nice day, all of you. <coughs> So team, good job.